Good morning to those of you who are in Europe and um, well, good afternoon, almost good evening to those of you who are joining us from Japan. I'm Judith Erika Maja, the country representative for Eurocent Japan, and I would like to warmly welcome you to the Horizon Europe Causing Today Japan. This webinar is uh, to highlight uh, programs, calls that are uh, specific for Japan, and this uh, particular webinar hopes to highlight these uh, pieces of information that you might need for the application. So let me just say a few words uh, about Horizon Europe. And prior to doing that, let me just uh, briefly uh, say thank you to uh, all our participants for joining. And uh, I will introduce them one by one uh, when they are about to give their presentation today. So Horizon Europe is the EU's key funding program for research and innovation with a budget of 95.5 billion. And it will run from 2021 from 2027. The first calls were, joined, uh, were uh, launched in uh, June. And um, this virtual event is uh, for research actors and interested parties from across the European research area and Japan who would like to uh, present applications and uh, submit a joint consortia in the future. In today's webinar, we are going to have a look at two clusters, cluster three and cluster five. Let me just say a few words about uh, both of these. Well, um, first, I would like to highlight Disaster Resilient Society for Europe. This particular destination supports the implementation of international policy frameworks. For example, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Agreement Sustainable Development Goals, EU risk management policies tackling natural and man-made threats, either accidental or international. The European Green Deal priorities, including the new EU climate adaptation strategy, uh, the COM 2021-82 uh, final, as well as the security union strategy and the counterterrorism agenda. When it comes to um, the other highlighted area, let me just again say a few words. Uh, that particular destination is for climate, uh, climate sciences and responses for the transformation towards climate neutrality. So Europe has been at the forefront of climate science and should retain its leadership position to support EU policies as well as international efforts for a global uptake for climate action in line with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals including, for example, biodiversity objectives. Advancing climate science and further broadening and deepening the knowledge base is essential to inform the societal transition towards a climate neutral and climate resilient society by 2050. Not only that, but also um, it's important to work towards a more ambitious greenhouse gas reduction target by 2030. So it will evolve involve research that furthers our understanding of past, present, and expected future changes in climate and its implications on ecosystems and society, closing knowledge gaps and develops the tool, um, developing the tool that supports this uh, policy coherence and the implementation of effective mitigation and adaptation solutions. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maria uh, Dortida the Senior Expert, General Directorate of Research and Innovation at the European Commission to tell us about cluster five, uh, destination three, and my colleague is going to help with the slides. Okay. okay. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good day to everyone. Um, my name is Maria Zuerziadu. I am a senior expert in renewable energies, uh, working in the European Commission in the Director General. And today we'll uh, brief you about uh, the Horizon Europe uh, Work Program 2021-22, uh, 
uh, related to Sorry. topics to biofuels and renewable fuels and uh, yeah. uh, apologies i'm sorry you might like to switch off your video because you're breaking up okay thank you so okay. much sorry about that no problem um as i said i will uh, talk today about uh, the uh, biofuels and renewable fuels which is a, a topics area under renewable energy an area under the destination of sustainable secure and competitive energy supply which is uh, featured under the uh, cluster five uh, climate energy and mobility of horizon europe next slide please next slide okay so before uh no no previous one so previous okay before going to the topics of the biofuels i would like to give you an overview of cluster five actually the work program of uh, cluster five includes uh, topics on climate topics on energy supply and energy systems topics on buildings on communities and cities and on transport whether it is uh, clean, safe, and transport mobility, smart mobility, as well as uh, energy storage. So the work program, um, the cluster five itself uh, has 15.1 billion for the seven years, and it includes uh, the work program uh, that includes also co-funded and co-programmed European partnerships. It includes institutional partnerships like the clean hydrogen, the rail, the clean aviation, the air traffic management, and also missions. Next uh, slide, please. Next, thank you. So the work program for the cluster five as an overview includes six destinations. The first uh, destination is on climate science. The second is on cross-cutting solutions like battery cities, uh, breakthrough technologies, citizen and stakeholder engagement. The destination three, where I'm talking about, the talks about the energy supply including renewable energy, energy systems and grids, CCUs and cross-cutting activities. And we have also other uh, destinations like the four on energy demand, five on uh, uh, clean and competitive solutions for all transport modes and the destination six on transport and smart mobility services. Next slide, please. Now going to the destination three on uh, and, uh, renewable energy and expected impacts, actually we would like to foster the European global leadership in affordable, secure and sustainable renewable energy technologies and services by improving their competitiveness in a global value chain and their position in growth markets, notably through the diversification of the renewable services and the technology portfolio. And through to do this, so we issued various topics under all types of renewable energies including biofuels and renewable fuels for which i'm talking next next slide please okay under the destination of uh, renewable uh, energy we want we know that um, renewable energy technologies provide major opportunities to replace or to substitute carbon from fossil origin in all sectors, in the power sector, in the heating and cooling, in the transportation, but as well in industry and the agriculture sector. In addition, advanced renewable fuels, including synthetic and sustainable advanced biofuels are needed because they can provide long-term carbon neutral solutions for the transport, but also the energy intensive industrial sectors. And what we need to do is to enhance the affordability, the security, the sustainability, and the efficiency for more established renewable energy technologies, such as the wind, the, energy, the photovoltaics, and the bioenergy, and further diversify the technology portfolio. But renewable energy technologies are the baseline on which to build a sustainable European and global climate neutral future. And this is why we are seeking in a certain topics international cooperation. Next slide, please. We are coming uh, to the first uh, topic uh, on biofuels and renewable fuels under horizon uh, work program 2021-2022, which is uh, the CL5 2020-21, D30303, entitled Hybrid Catalytic Conversion of Renewable Energy to Carbon Neutral Fuels. 
the scope under this topic is to develop hybrid, hybrid catalytic conversion processes by combining chemical, electrochemical, biological, biochemical, and thermochemical catalytic processes to convert the renewable energy to carbon uh, neutral uh, renewable fuels of biological or non-biological origin. So both biofuels and renewable fuels of non-biological origin are covered here through hybrid catalytic conversion systems. So we need to develop and combine novel catalysts and linked lab scale components and our systems. So the proposals should uh, or may develop catalyst center systems with dual function as appropriate. For example, catalysts and sorbents or other. It, uh, the proposals should combine at least two different catalyst types into a single multi-catalytic materials as appropriate. Uh, and the reason is that we need to improve the conversion of a broader variety of molecules from the same feedstock, meaning that from the same feedstock, we need to convert more molecules, uh, a bigger type of molecules, and a broader application of hybrid catalytic systems in upscale processes. So the catalyst should be more functional from the feedstock point of view, but from the application point of view. Um, the proposal should improve significantly the conversion e efficiency and the specific marginal cost uh, reduction and uh, maximize, of course, the greenhouse gas emissions abatement. So for this, we encourage international cooperation uh, and the combination of hydrogen, electrolytic production and separate use of CO2 catalytic conversion is not in scope, like hydrogen as a final product is not in scope. It is a renewable fuel of non-biological origin, but it is not in scope. More synthetic fuels are sought here. Next slide, please. So the outcomes, uh, all the uh, outcomes that are listed here should be um, uh, reached uh, by the project uh, results that uh, like to foster the availability of synergetic catalytic systems for carbon neutral renewable fuels, so more available systems like that, to improve the performance of car carbon neutral renewable fuels and renewable and European competitiveness. So to have um, uh, better uh, performing carbon neutral fuels through these systems and to accelerate the development of efficient carbon neutral renewable fuels. So to have uh, not only better performance, but uh, uh, reaching uh, closer to the market, uh, uh, this type of efficient carbon neutral fuels. Next slide, please. The specificities, uh, specific conditions for this topic is a, a research and innovation action. The technology readiness level, which is expected at the end of the project is TRL three or four. So we are talking about the very low TRL level research. And uh, the budget which is available for this uh, topic is 10 million overall. We expect uh, the projects to have uh, an average uh, EU contribution of 3.3 million, and we expect to fund three projects out of this. Important, the opening uh, deadline is 2nd September 2021. This means this coming September in uh, a month uh, and something. And the deadline is on the 23rd of February in 2022. Next slide, please. The second topic for which we uh, uh, encourage and expect international cooperation is the CL5 2022, D30302. And it is about the best international practice for scaling up sustainable biofuels. So the scope of this uh, topic is actually to foster international cooperation to develop best practices and concepts along the entire value chain for accelerating scale up of sustainable biofuels worldwide. This means that we want to put concepts of entire value chains uh, taking advantage of the best practices uh, uh, along, uh, all around the, the world. Uh, this, uh, pro the proposals here should address systemic constraints and opportunities for scaling up complete value chains and propose solutions. So we have constraints uh, at uh, the various parts of the value chain, either the feedstock or the conversion or the downstream uh, 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 upgrading or uh, applications. And in all these places, we would like to see what are the systemic constraints and how the, these can be overcome. The proposal should cover any sustainable non-food or feed biomass feedstock. 
uh, and any innovative technology or combinations of them. For example, as we said, thermochemical, biochemical, uh, biological, any innovative technology or combinations. Uh, the proposals should enhance the overall cost effectiveness and sustainability of large scale production based on a life cycle uh, assessment and analysis. And they should address social, economic, and environmental aspects while uh, we expect to have uh, um, uh, international cooperation, in particular with uh, mission innovation uh, countries. And uh, you may uh, be aware that there are mission innovation, uh, there's a mission innovation on energy policy, and many countries, including Japan, are participating into this to enhance research and innovation for those related to energy and climate. Next slide, please. So what are the expected outcomes here? Uh, the project results are expected to contribute to all of, of the following expected outcomes. So the first is to build a global knowledge for scaling up and the sustainability assessment of sustainable biofuel value chains. The second is to contribute to cost effective and more sustainable uh, large scale production of fuels. The third is to excel capacity building for sustainable biofuels in the world. The fourth is to develop networks for skill development and knowledge sharing in sustainable biofuel value chains worldwide. And of course, uh, these other uh, expected outcomes are to contribute to the mission innovation, which is an international. Um, effort and to contribute to the set plan action aid, which is a European uh, effort. And to the final slide, please. Uh, this uh, um, type of action is also a research and innovation action. Uh, the technology readiness level, which is expected to be achieved here at the end of the project, is uh, uh, 405. The EU contribution overall in this topic is 9 million, and each project uh, is expected to have a contribution of 3 million. So we expect to fund uh, three projects out of this topic. This uh, topic opens on the 6th of September of 2022, in a year from now, and the deadline is on the 10th of January 2023. Next slide, please. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Maria. And indeed, we are going to have time uh, for questions later. Uh, let us continue with um, yet another presentation and explanation of the calls. So next up is a video recording by uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Philippe uh, Kovabie. He's going to talk about cluster three, uh, the disaster uh, resilient topic. So let me just pull this up very, very fast. One second. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very happy to be with you Today, I'm uh, Philippe Quevauvillier from the uh, European Commission, that is DG Home. I'm working in a program called uh, Civil Security for Society, and I'm in charge in this program of a thematic area which is related to disaster resilient societies. And it is what I will actually present you uh, today. Uh, so, the, the title exactly is Civil, society, Civil Security for Societies, focus on disaster resilient societies related which has a clear dimension related to uh, EU-Japan cooperation. So the first uh, thing I would like to say in the next slide is that we are part of the Horizon Europe, that is a new program for development. And in this uh, program, we are uh, representing the cluster three, which is related to civil security for society. So it's among six uh, main clusters of a pillar which is uh, related to research and development. So next slide, please. Uh, in this cluster, we have, we are following up a different type of uh, objectives, which are mainly to support uh, EU policies in uh, related to security, uh, security union, uh, counter-terrorism, um, pact, new pact on migration, asylum, but also disaster risk reduction policies, climate adaptation strategy, maritime security, 
strategy and so on. And regarding international cooperation, this disaster risk reduction has a clear potential because we are uh, not only supporting EU policies, but also international policies like the, the Sendai uh, framework for action. And in this respect, we have a certain number of uh, impacts which are uh, highlighted in this slide. And one of them is uh, related to uh, enhanced disaster risk reduction and management. And my focus today will be really about this. So in the second slide, in the next slide, you will see that um, we have uh, our program is composed of six main destinations dealing with fight uh, against crime and terrorism border management border security resilient infrastructure the uh, area on disaster within society and a horizontal thematic area which is covering for example foresight studies market study but also networking it's complemented by uh, another area which is uh, managed by another director general DG connect that is on, on uh, i would say uh, uh, it it issues related to cyber security and uh, digital environment we'll see in the next slide that uh, i will be focusing uh, only on three um, main areas which are covered by the design society for for europe uh, which is actually um, including societal resilience, that is uh, how to increase risk awareness and preparedness for citizens, improving disaster risk management and governance, and strengthening capacities of first and uh, second responders. Next slide, please. In this respect, the uh, impact that we are expecting in this uh, destination are related to uh, enhanced uh, understanding, improved knowledge base, situational awareness, and so on. Um, for um, related to risk, um, I would say, faced by citizens, help, helping actually the so society to uh, to uh, to act by by themselves, thus raising the resilience of European society. We are also dealing with uh, an enhanced cross-sectoral, cross-disciplines, cross-border cooperation of disaster risk management overall. That is uh, looking at the cycle uh, from prevention to uh, recovery, to from international to local levels. Uh, we are also looking at standardization aspects related to crisis management of any kind of crisis and severity, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive related risk. And finally, to strengthen capacities of first responders in all the operational phases um, related to disaster of natural accidental man-made or terrorism uh, disasters that they are um, that they are facing to uh, help them to be, be better, better prepared in their uh, operations uh, in, um, uh, in rescuing triage of victims and so on next slide please the uh, topics which are actually open to uh, international cooperation um, will be uh, there, are, there is one which is running now, which has been opened on the 15th of June. So the 2021 call is open until the 23rd of November. And we have two main um, topics which are related to enhanced assessment of disaster risk capabilities and scenario building based on uh, historical data and projections, that is scenario building, which is um, earmarked as international dimension. And a topic which, are, which is more related to the crisis that we are now facing on pandemics, on fast uh, deployed mobile laboratories to handle situational awareness for pandemics. And this is specifically, uh, there is a specific mention on EU-Japan uh, cooperation. In 2022, um, the same timing will be applied, that is uh, a call published in June 2022 with a deadline in November 2022. And here you see that we have four main topics. One is related to hand and citizen preparedness in the event of a disaster uh, or crisis related emergency. Uh, another one is looking at uh, improved impact forecasting early warning system to support rapid deployment of first responder in vulnerable areas. And really it's really to anticipate a disaster uh, before it is hitting and to deploy uh, uh, first responders in these areas and uh, to, to help better, for example, evacuation of populations. 
Then we have another topic, which is uh, a potential interest to EU-Japan cooperation, which is improved international cooperation, addressing first responders' capability gaps. And it is related to um, a network which is called IFA3, which is International Forum for Advanced First Responder Innovation, which uh, Japan is a member. It, uh, Japan has been a fund funding uh, member of this uh, association, which is which has been built in 2014-15, and we had a meeting in Tokyo to to build uh, this uh, this association. So, if you are interested, I can provide you more information. And another topic where EU-Japan cooperation is also highlighted is related to enhance situational awareness and preparedness of first responders and improve capacities to minimize time to react in urban areas in case of a CBRN related event. So this is also earmarked to Japan. I would like to stress that um, this is quite a very, very uh, short description of the topics which are uh, currently published. I would encourage you if you uh, are uh, interested by this, read very deeply the, in depth the work program and to come to your specific, specific questions. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, I would like uh, I would like to give some more details on the three topics which I mentioned, uh, where EU Japan uh, cooperation um, is highlighted, and the first one is on the mobile laboratories um, uh, deployment, fast deployment, and in this respect, we are expecting that uh, existing mobile laboratories will be uh, compared. Um, uh, including different structures, both military and civilian. We want to have some dem demonstration of different existing uh, facilities. We wish to see new uh, mobile laboratory solutions uh, to fastly uh, and ambiguously detect and identify infection actions, to have better and faster di diagnosis tests, monitoring, mapping of contamination, and in uh, well, overall enhancing data, uh, field data communication to decision-making authorities. We also wish to uh, help orchestrate better mobile laboratory capacities in the EU and improvement in the management of trained staff in, in Europe. Obviously, it's, uh, since it's open to international cooperation, in particular to Japan, if uh, Japanese partners would join, they would be brought uh, together to this uh, different type of demonstration and research development. Um, we uh, expect to have uh, responders, organizations or agencies or representing of local or regional authorities to take part of the project. And our indicative budget for two projects is 8 million euros, that is 4 million euro per project. I would like to stress that um, several projects are taking place in this area. I put slide as 2020, that is Horizon 2020 legacy about technologies. And you see that there are four acronyms which are indicated, PANDEM 2, STAMINA, SAFE CARE, and PATO 3rd, which are ongoing uh, projects uh, which will be terminating uh, next year or in two years from now. For this, again, you, so you have, uh, we may send you additional information. And it's quite important if you wish to uh, already take contact with consortia, European consortia, to which you might um, be interested to, to, to partner. So don't hesitate again to, to contact me. If you need to have contacts in, in Europe, uh, I will be very happy to, to help you in this respect. So the next topic in the next slide, which uh, is uh, dealing then to the 2022 call, that is, uh, I mentioned the improved international cooperation addressing first responding, uh, responder capability gaps. And you see that there are a certain number of outcomes coming well, the, the, the concerning uh, real-time detection, tracking analysis of different situations, more targeted, actionable intelligence, uh, more efficient common operations uh, related to fast analysis of different information sources, global interoperabilities of different type of first responders, uh, and, uh, that are oriented on international, internationally defined requirements and recognized practices. 
I would like to stress that all these uh, gaps uh, have been identified by the so-called IFAFRI network, uh, and from, um, International Forum to Advance First Responder Innovation. And you see in the little uh, box uh, Japan uh, uh, appearing uh, with a certain number of uh, not only European, but you, because you have also, um, uh, for example, Canada and the uh, USA, who are partner of this, this network. And we would like to give uh, actually a push to, to this international initiative regarding uh, the different gaps that have been identified. It will also be open to a different uh, type of international group. I mentioned UNDRR is United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Scientific and Technical, Technical Advisory Group, that is the ISTAG, in which um, I presume that Japan is also a member. So it's really targeted to international cooperation for a budget of 5 million euros that will require the active involvement of at least three first responders um, organizations or agency and three different EU or associated countries, plus, I would say, international partners. International partners are not uh, indicated here, but obviously uh, we will most welcome uh, Japan as, as a partner in this topic. So moving moving ahead with uh, another topic for 2022, I would like to, to uh, just give a few words on uh, this topic on uh, enhanced institutional awareness and preparedness of first responders and improved capacity to minimize time to react in urban areas in the case of CDRN related events. And you see that in a, it's an innovation action. So it's not research per se, it's more related to a mix of development of tools, technologies related to civil and uh, situational awareness, um, rapid, uh, more rapid reactions to civil and events, identification of civil uh, and uh, suspicious samples, and so on, uh, including development of fast, reliable, uh, portable devices, decision making related to protective equipment, and so on. And it has a strong component on demonstrating different solutions, integrating different commercial experimental sensor platforms, which uh, aim to improve the, the overall state of the art. So it's why it's an innovation action. We want really to uh, bring forward to a, um, a TRL, that is technology uh, within a level of six to eight, that is close to the market, of a prototype uh, existing solutions that are not yet actually marketed. So, uh, enabling to demonstrate them in a consortia, international consortia, and to ensure that we are uh, providing solutions which are harmonized and consolidated regarding the research uh, component. So this uh, topic has a total budget of 11 million euros, that is for two projects, 5.5, each of them with, um, as I said, it's a criteria of 6.8, involvement of three beneficiaries of uh, first responders organizations and three uh, different EU member states or associated countries plus Japanese partners if uh, interested. I have stressed also uh, some projects which are um, building up uh, regarding uh, well, which, which legacy has enabled this project to be, this topic to be built up. Um, they are called NCECO, Inotis, Proactive, Terrific, I put you, I put you here the acronym. I suggest that you uh, Google them and you will find actually possible contact there uh, of uh, partners who will certainly propose um, proposals in, uh, the, in the, under this topic. If you need help to liaise with uh, people from this uh, project, please do not hesitate to, to contact me. I will be very happy to provide you uh, contact names there so because you are, it's quite difficult sometimes for for Japanese, maybe to, to build up a consortia involving uh, involving the, the organizations. So don't hesitate. I will be very happy to help you if needed. And it brings me to the last uh, part of my uh, speech, uh, which is to mention uh, something which might also be interesting to Japanese um, uh, scientists, Japanese authorities, um, a development of. Uh, what we are calling a community for European research and innovation for security, which is composed of different expert groups related to uh, areas I mentioned the uh, infrastructure, infra, DRS, which is Disaster Resilient Society, 
FCT, fight against crime and terrorism, border management, and this SSRI, which is strengthened and um, uh, strengthened scientific and technological uh, research and innovation support. And we are, uh, each of the thematic area are um, organizing thematic workshops. Most of them in the first part of the year are uh, virtual um, and in which we are exchanging on scientific state of the art, um, scientific, I would say, need, research needs by different uh, stakeholders, practitioners, uh, different uh, SMEs, industry, civil society, and so on. So we are we are uh, developing a lot of uh, exchanges all over all over the year, and we are trying to link with national and or regional platforms when uh, possible to really get uh, this information transmitted to um, national or regional entities and to get feedback uh, from them on how to improve our research programming. Um, this service platform is open for uh, any kind of uh, registration. If you are interested to follow up uh, this uh, dialogue, I would encourage you to, to register. And you will find in the next slide the uh, way to register. You have a certain number of links which are um, uh, established here, uh, not only looking at this community uh, for European research and innovation, but also looking at uh, different um, uh, texts related to um, contact points, uh, different uh, networks related to year funding, um, agencies like, for example, Frontex in Europe, which is related to border management, ULISA, which is more on crime and terrorism, and so on. Uh, and in the last slide, which I wanted to, to show you, you will find um, a link to subscribe to this series um, network. And I would invite you to look at the uh, and a video and for day, which I recorded some 10 days ago, which is covering all the topics of the um, area in cluster three. And please don't hesitate to contact me uh, using my email address if you wish to have more details on the uh, DRS call. And obviously to have uh, possible uh, names, possible contact of organization, which you would need uh, in, in, in Europe. And I hope that it has not been too, too confused. It's always difficult to get this kind of uh, speech in, uh, in a virtual way. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to, to meet in, uh, I would say, physically in a way, in a physical attendance rather than virtually. And uh, I might uh, next year in, in springtime, so maybe for the 2020, uh, I would be happy to, to help you further if needed. And I wish you a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, again, that was a video recording, and we are welcoming uh, questions at a later stage in the webinar. Uh, I would like to invite uh, um, Mr. Mikkel Emaldi, and he's with uh, Technalia and Eurosense Worldwide. His presentation will focus on cluster five, destination one. So, uh, Mikkel, if you would mind uh, sharing your slides, please. I'm very sorry. Perfect. And we can see you in full screen. Yeah, absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so this slide has been presented already. Uh, today we are talking on pillar two of the Horizon Europe uh, framework program. Uh, the previous speaker has been talking on the cluster three, which is the civil security for society. Uh, and Maria and myself will be talking on cluster five, which deals on climate, energy, and mobility. Uh, as was mentioned, Maria was talking on destination. I mean, the cluster five is divided in six parts, which are called destinations. Maria has been talking on cluster three energy. I will be presenting as a part of uh, destination one with this on climate. Uh, by the way, this is the uh, well, you will have access to this presentation, but uh, this is the the URL of the full uh, cluster five work program description. This is a 
500 page uh, document which describes 186 i believe topics uh, pillar two as i mentioned is divided in six clusters clusters i divide are divided in destinations and destinations are divided i describe topics any project proposal is got to address one of these topics and as i mentioned cluster five uh, defines for the period 2021-2022 describes 186 topics uh, there's no way we can describe 186 topics so uh, we will just uh, providing a few examples uh, this is again information the main cluster five info page is here and at the beginning of each uh, call for proposals uh, the commission organizes what they call info days in at the info days the commission provides information and they also provide uh, facilities for matchmaking among interested parties in this particular case we have here the links to the general uh, cluster five info day and then a couple videos for destination one and for destination three i will be presenting uh, a couple uh, topics which are these two topics in destination one topic 0202 and topic 0204 O3. Both deal on modeling from different point of views. And then there's also a comment here, which is INCO for topic uh, for the first topic. Uh, I mentioned already that in uh, cluster five, the in the in the for the first two years, uh, the the work plan defines uh, 186 uh, topics. Uh, Japanese uh, interested parties can collaborate in any of these 186 topics, but there are 42 of them which the Commission understands are especially suitable for international cooperation, which means that uh, not only that uh, non-European countries can collaborate, but that the Commission expects that the objectives of the topic will be much more difficult to collaborate without international cooperation. So cooperation is expected. In some cases, they do mention particular countries, such as um, the previous speaker mentioned Japan in some of, in some of the topics. There, there are others in which uh, Japan is mentioned in particular. And in, but in, in other topics, uh, no country is uh, specially mentioned. It just says that uh, this topic is what they call specially suitable for international cooperation. Uh, these two topics, uh, the deadline for these two topics will be uh, February next year. So there's a fair amount of time to prepare proposals. In both cases, uh, proposals are expected for what the Commission calls research and innovation actions, which are the typical um, research, applied research, basically applied research uh, projects involving a, a number of different partners from different countries. This, regarding timing, we can see here that the, 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 well, the work program was published in June this year. On the 5th of July, we had the information day for these uh, topics. As I just mentioned, the deadline for proposal submission will be February uh, next year. On the, 3rd of, the 10th of January at 5 p.m. Uh, Brussels time. Uh, then, the evaluation, the proposal evaluation takes place. Typically, the evaluation takes up to five months. And then typically you have a, um, about 
around three far, I mean three other months <clears throat> for the contract uh, negotiation with the commission for the projects which have been selected as the best of the proposed uh, proposals. And then towards the end, the end of next year, the project execution will, will start. So we are, we are looking at medium, medium term uh, proposals. The first, the first of these two topics I just mentioned is this one is uh, named development of high resolution earth system models for global and regional climate change projection. So we are talking of modeling. What the, the topic is looking for is fully coupled models in order to, to, to ascertain which are, which are the inputs which drive and influence climate change at global and regional scale and any scale. Uh, these um, models are expected to make use of uh, obs observational data of any kind, especially for validation verification of the of the model predictions. And in particular, they are expected to make use of uh, satellite uh, data, and in particular, the, the the topic mentions Copernicus and Galileo, but. Other, other satellites are also more than welcome. And also the uh, proposals are expected to build on existing experiences and results from other projects, especially uh, Euro European funded projects, but not only European projects and any kind of uh, project might contribute to the success of these uh, new, uh, new generation uh, climate models. Also, the, the Commission expects, uh, I mean, the, there is other, there's another program, which is not Europe, uh, not Horizon Europe, which is the Digital Europe program. And this program is supposed to, to be provided a number of facilities which could be useful for these uh, proposals. Uh, the commission is very strong. Uh, well, excuse me for this clock. I mean, I, I cannot mute it. Uh, hopefully, we'll finish soon. The whole Horizon Europe pro framework program is very keen on what is called open science. And in particular, in this topic, uh, the, the, well, the topic expects uh, open access to the to many of the results of the of the projects in the in in the shape of a model code a data open data and so on uh, this is not something which is compulsory in the topic but uh, if if uh, the the, the proponents are not willing to provide all results in an open fashion, they, they will have to justify uh, why, possibly because of commercial reasons or what well, other, other reasons. As I mentioned, in this topic in particular, international cooperation is encouraged. And uh, of course, uh, uh, for uh, projects funded under, under this topic, uh, the, the Commission expects for them to cooperate with other projects funded under the same uh, topic and also under other topics. For example, this cluster six destination five, cluster six, if you remember, is um, uh, the uh, name Land, Ocean, Water for Climate Action. This is climate action from a different point of view, but it's still climate action. The outcomes of these projects, uh, well, the results of these projects are expected to contribute to all of these uh, expected outcomes from the topic, which basically are improved climate projections, 
uh, improve understanding and modeling of anything that might impact uh, clima climatic uh, systems. Uh, better uh, knowledge of the of the anthropophonic uh, forces of climate change. Uh, linkages with integrated assessment models such as those described in the following topic and uh, in general support of international uh, cooperation because of course climate is not a regional problem climate is a, is the a, a globe which uh, which matters and as I mentioned, this is a research innovation uh, proposals as for research innovation actions. The topic has got a budget for this for these two years of 20 million. And the commission understands that uh, the typical proposal will be around 10 million. Therefore, there's money for two projects. And as I mentioned, the deadline is the, the 10th February next year. The second topic deals with the improvement of integrated assessment models in support of climate policies. So this is modeling again. The idea is to improve the state of the art, as was the case in the previous topic. Uh, the topic is looking for an integrate, in integrate, sorry, an integrated framework. It doesn't mean that it's going to be one single software code to incorporate everything, this is not the, this is not this is not likely to happen. It will be probably several models, but uh, they need to be in somehow integrated in order to pro to provide one single solution. And this is supposed to be uh, supporting uh, sectoral details, sectoral changes. Uh, temporal resolution technological support is supposed to deal with a uh, regional and regional analysis uh, uh, is supposed to support behavioral and lifestyle changes is going to support support distribution and equity effect of climate policies is is going to support again the you know the un um, sustainable development goals and so on. The final comment is that this the above list is not exhaustive. Therefore, anything which is significant is expected to be supported by this uh, integrated model. Also, e even the lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis. It is expected to build, of course, on previous initiatives uh, and ex explore, as I mentioned, alternative approaches to this modeling. And finally, it's supposed to be uh, uh, to do involve end users uh, in the in the development of the models. So. The, these, pro these proposals are expected to, to deal with a significant amount of networking. Uh, again, the issue of open access uh, is very significant in this case. And in this particular case, also the issue of social sciences uh, is, is important. Therefore, this is not only a technical uh, topic, technical from the mathematical or physical discipline point of view. This is expected to deal with social sciences because uh, the impact, the, the models will have an impact in the individual citizen. And uh, this proposal for this topic as expected to incorporate or to do marketing at the level of society and the, the individual uh, citizens. Outcomes. The outcomes are, well, basically I've mentioned a number of them. Uh, the idea is to improve 
the existing integrated assessment models so that we have a new generation of them dealing with all level of uh, problems at the international, global, European, national and regional levels is going is expected to support the European Green Deals, the Paris Agreement, the uh, UN SDG, etc. Is going to be dealing or con supporting uh, all kinds of international uh, well, efforts. And uh, something important is that uh, it's going to provide awareness or good awareness of the results across uh, a number of end user groups, uh, the society as a whole, etc. Well, uh, at the end of the day, uh, these uh, improved uh, integrated assessment models are going to are expected to help us uh, reach uh, the climate neutrality targets uh, specific at different levels. And regarding budgets, the Commission has got 15 million for this uh, topic during these 21 and 22 years. Projects are expected to be smaller than for the previous uh, topic, uh, basically around 5 million. So there is budget enough for three, three of these projects to be funded. And this is it from my, from my side. We are going to continue with a panel that's to address past best practices. So I would like to invite uh, Nathan Clark to talk about the Lynx project in the first instance. Thanks, Thank Julia. Can you hear me all right? Yes, perfectly. If Perfect. Let's go from there. So thanks again for having me. Um, good to be back here. My name is Nathan Clark. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Lynx project. Um, quick facts and figures about, about the project, just to give an overview. We are also a, a DRS call, so under the Disaster Resilience Societies. Uh, we were under the Horizon 2020 program, closely linked to, to some of the Horizon calls that Philippe introduced in the, in the last session, and also a research and innovation action. We started a year ago, so June 1st, 2020, or a little bit over a year ago, and we run for a duration of 42 months. Um, a big consortium, 15 partners, civil protection agencies, emergency management organizations, NGOs, a few SMEs, and research institutes from across Europe, six different countries involved. And we have two associated partners. So we have a partner from the Balkan region uh, here in Europe, the Disaster Prevention and Preparedness Initiative, and also our, our partner from Kobe University, so the Center for Resilient Design, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about today. Just quickly, what we what we do in Links. So you have an overview of, of our, our vision and objectives. We are trying to strengthen links between technologies and societies for improving disaster resilience. We do that by producing sustainable advanced learning. So that's learning produced both by and also for different types of stakeholders based on their needs. And we produce that learning on social media and crowdsourcing and disasters. So the different uses really of, of this in all phases of the disaster management cycle. Um, to do that, we conduct studies across a number of domains. So we're looking at a, a social domain, really looking at disaster risk perception and vulnerability. We're looking at a, an institutional domain, so disaster management processes, really looking at those governance processes. And we're looking at the technologies themselves. So does that what we call disaster community technologies, not only social media and crowdsourcing technologies, but other ICTs and, and technologies that would be used by, by different uh, relevant stakeholders in emergency or crisis situations. Um, based on those, we, we uh, have a number of outputs. The key output of Lynx is a framework, an, an online framework. It's embedded within our Lynx Community Center, an online platform. The framework has uh, different types of um, uh, uh, tools or methods or cases or guidelines based on the, the objective of an organization or a stakeholder and what they want to do, all related again to social media and crowdsourcing, best practices, worst practices, good practices, 
um, depending on, on, on the certain instance and what they want to do. We evaluate that framework in a number of different cases in Europe. So we're looking at flooding in Denmark, drought and terrorism in, in Germany, industrial hazards here in the Netherlands, and also considering a, a case in Japan looking at tsunamis, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm going to skip through these, but I'll share these slides with Judith so that if you're interested in the project, you can see a little bit more about how it's designed and what we're doing in this upcoming period. But I've only got a few minutes here, so I, I think I'll go right to the heart of, of what Judith asked us to, to speak about today. Um, in terms of, of our collaboration with J Japan, um, we have an associated partnership with the Center for Resilient Design at Kobe University. Um, and for activities, this has entailed so far a lot of internal meetings and, and seminars. Again, the first year of the project has really been about uh, uh, establishing that scientific base. So we haven't had a lot of field work yet or, or trials of, of sorts. So uh, mostly everything virtual these days, but uh, virtual meetings and seminars, which, which uh, our partners from, from Kobe University have participated in quite a few of those. Um, external dis dissemination activities, be those conferences or joint publications, uh, what have you, continuing to engage in those activities. And as we move now into the, the next phases of the project, um, we'll have some, uh, uh, um, uh, some workshops that are planned, hopefully in person, that's the idea, both here in Europe and in Japan. And we hold a budget as the coordinator for, for, for bringing researchers over um, from Kobe University to those, to those workshops and also for for ourselves to travel. So organizing some expert workshops around some of the topics we're dealing with in the project that, that, uh, that they're working with as well at the Center for Resilient Design. And hopefully in the, in the, in the upcoming um, casework, the field work we'll be doing, we'll be able to integrate um, a field study on, on tsunamis um, in Japan, but that there's, it's a bit of a, a, a tricky situation is we don't have a, a budget for that within the project. So it relies also on the resources and commitment from the partners in, at Kobe University. But we do that at three iterations in the project. So if, if it doesn't happen in this first iteration, some opportunities down the line as well. And then of course, helping them to align our, our international policy targets and, and the outputs in that regard. Um, I think outside of the, the European context, um, the partners from Co from University of um, Kobe University would be very useful in that regard. Just to give you a very quick example of one of the activities we've done, so this happened uh, late last year. Um, we hold practitioner task force uh, meetings in the project, which are really opportunities for practitioners and also research institutes, but the different organizations within the consortium to talk about their needs, expectations, um, what they're working with locally and what they're, what they're thinking about that could be integrated in the project. So some really interesting presentations came out of that from our partners in, at Kobe University, uh, particularly interested in, in potentially linking up with, with, um, with the first presentation here on, on uh, collaborative research and assessment tools for tsunami evacuation plans. Um, so really modeling out evacuation routes for vulnerable groups, be they, in this case, there's a, a slide for infants, but also elderly groups, and providing that information through, through mobile apps that uh, gives them uh, the right routes in, in case of, of certain emergencies um, uh, based on different variables. So the last, or coming to the last slide here, and I think what the, the purpose of, of, of um, this event today is, and, and hopefully we can I can give some advice here based on our experiences, at least in terms of best practices. And if you're really interested in getting into one of these, um, these projects or these consortiums, uh, based on our experience, it's really important to establish your contacts early. These proposals take a long time to draft and they're very competitive. So you need to, to get started as soon as those calls are out. Um, set aside time and budget for, for writing and, and making those contacts, I think, through brokerage events at Brussels or looking at old projects that are in the same domain or dealing with similar uh, um, um, subjects and projects that are only just about to finish and reaching out to those consortiums and having discussion with them. I can tell you that that is how, how Link started. We reached out to a project that was finishing and it, it was a natural transgression to, to build another um, consortium from that. Um, and Philip, I think, also mentioned in his presentation today a lot of opportunities for reaching out to, to different mechanisms in, in Brussels that can help you make those connections. But important to start that early 
um, building those partnerships and and aim for full partnerships. In hindsight, you know, it, we have an associated partnership with Kobe University, and uh, it could have been beneficial also to have that as a as a full partnership. It gives you a lot of steering in the direction of that proposal, um, and also a bit more engagement in the activity. So the ability to have that engagement, I think, is is really important. So uh, uh, advocating for that, um, prioritize grounded impact based approaches. As researchers, we often get caught up in our own scientific sort of um, concepts and our, our bubbles. And I think these projects really demand that you think about the end users and exploitation routes, the innovation side of these um, a, a tangible results that you can show throughout the, the project lifetime is, is quite important for the commission um, and, and can't be overstated here. Um, Maintaining, and once you're in one of the projects, maintaining the high levels of, uh, of external engagement with these networks and projects, there's a lot of work that's already been done. And these, these projects become sort of a, a bubble that you, they become your own world and you sometimes forget to get outside that bubble. And it's really important to continue to engage externally and, uh, and you'll learn a lot from that. You'll avoid duplications and you can, and you can combine some of your efforts too. And last, um, which seems like a, a no brainer, but something that I, I can't emphasize enough is really high levels of risk management and contingency planning in these projects. I think these upcoming calls will be likely, uh, hopefully not, but likely affected from COVID in, in many ways is the way we were. And I can't uh, tell you how, how many impacts COVID had really on, on research field work, our events, our, our management of the consortium. We've been together a year, we've never met in person. So really thinking through um, how you'll, you'll balance those things is important, I think. And then last, I'll, as I said, I'll share these slides with Judith. There's some information if you want to know more about our Lynx project. We've got a leaflet in, in Japanese. Our deliverables, um, some deliverable scientific deliverables are up on the website. And we had our first conference this month already. And there's a link to that uh, event on, on, on YouTube if, uh, if you're interested. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we are to commence with a video recording. Uh, by um, Dr. Osamu Kojima, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Engineering at Kobe University. And um, I would like to invite uh, Michele uh, Chito, who is a PhD student and early stage researcher at the University of Glasgow. We are going to talk about the Terra Apps project. Thank you for introduction. I really appreciate this opportunity to introduce TerraApps and my experience. Furthermore, hopefully you will have an interest in TerraHealth technologies. First of all, I will briefly introduce TerraApps. Unfortunately, I do not understand this project completely. So if you have any questions, please send an email. This project is mainly targeting the training of PhD students in the telehealth technologies for imaging, radar, and communication applications. Each institute belonging to this project provides a unique research training opportunity for early stage researchers. This project offers strategic training opportunities for career development in both academia and industry, and a potential of dramatic impact on the imaging, radar, communications, and sensing application areas. Maintain international, academic, and industrial partners, and 14 support partner organizations con construct these tele-app networks, and these main partners will host 15 early stage researchers. The main 10 institutes are listed here. This network consists of 10 institutes from eight different countries, including Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, United Kingdom, and Spain. In this list, Kobe University is a partner of the University of Glasgow. This is the list of partner organizations supporting this project. These 14 partners collaborate on the project and provide excellent secondment opportunities and leading training workshops. T 
to complement the PhD of the early stage researchers. Furthermore, the partners are expected to provide them with a taste of the professional future after they finish with the project. This list this represents the early stage researchers in TeraApps. The first person, Michele, is a PhD student in the University of Glasgow, and he joined our laboratory in Kobe one month in winter of 2019. He is currently working towards his PhD degree in electrical electronic engineering at the Photonics Devices Group, University of Glasgow, under the supervision of Professor Richard Hogg. As a member of TeraUp pro program, he works at the resonant tunneling diode, architectural wafer design, manufacture, and characterization. According to Professor Hogg's recommendation, I joined this project in 2019, and I provided my knowledge of spectroscopy. This is one of the papers uh, published by him. He obtained the experimental results in our laboratory. Finally, I would like to explain what terahertz is. Tera means 10 to the 12th power, and hertz is the unit of frequency. Therefore, terahertz indicates the 10 to the 12th power hertz. This frequency is the boundary between the electronics and photonics. So various future applications are expected, including ultra-fast telecommunication, sensing toxic or dangerous gas or materials, and security application. Maybe you have seen body scanners in airports. For such a terahertz technology area, I have worked with Professor Hogg and we have published several papers. This third paper is just published, and here a sort of terahertz spectroscopy is discussed. If you are interested, please download it. Download is free. Unfortunately, time is up. Thank you for taking your time. Well, again, Professor uh, Osamu Kojima couldn't be with us today, but we have uh, uh, Michele online. And uh, I was wondering if uh, you could answer a few questions in, in the section right after all the presentations are done. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So let us proceed with the next presentation. We have uh, Professor Bernard Chenevier, the Director of Research at uh, CNRS, Okayama University, and he is to talk about the BRKO project. Uh, Bernard, if you would like to share your slides. I'm going to share. Yes, thank you very much, uh, okay. Judy. Thank you so and much. Thank you very much uh, for access for inviting me for this uh, very brief talk about uh, what I'm doing at uh, Okayama University where I am trying to implement a culture of large-scale research project in Japanese universities. And I will talk a little bit about the focus on uh, BRKO at Okayama University. BRKO is uh, uh, about archaeology and uh, Ms. Nienken uh, Duisman has already briefly introduced it during her talk. Uh, it will be a very short talk and I will take questions uh, after that at any time if uh, there are any of those. So my mission at Okayama University is to develop international research partnership development, and I'm trying to implement a culture of international research in the field of excellence. And this is uh, what uh, the, uni the Japanese universities need most in order to uh, fight the, I would say the green situation of the, they have in the international uh, rankings. And, I'm, and I am working a lot 
on uh, EU related project. I have a holistic approach from the approach developed by modern universities. I'm not going to develop too much this. And by relying on excellent research, we are supposed to project a nice image abroad. We increase the reputation and in, we, if we increase the reputation in return, we can wait for better funding. Of course, we have to professionalize international best practices in the field of research proposal building, international relation, communication sciences, all fields where Japanese universities have a lot to do. So my background is a CNRS, Grenoble, material science. Uh, I am a specialist of solid state physics, material science, and I have been working for many, many years on the Milatech site in Grenoble. My first contact with Japan goes back uh, nearly 30 years ago when I was in Scuba working on the high TC superconductors at an ancestor of NIMS as a postdoc, as I mentioned. After the scuba postdoc, I uh, stayed 25 years at Grenoble, where I published more than 100 papers in international journals. And I had a number of visits from Japan or to Japan uh, in order to keep my, my close relation with Japan. I moved to Japan recently in 2014 and probably forever. My mission at Tokada is to improve the global profile of the university by improving research development. So that's what I do. I am uh, relying on my experience of uh, my long experience, I would say, of researchers and uh, research manager. And I am developing a range of international projects at Okayama University. And I hope that probably in the, within a few years, four or five years, we should probably be the best university in Japan in the field. Among all the projects I am uh, working on, I have, uh, in, I am supervising and more than supervising, sometimes initiating and building and writing and drafting and so on, 10 EU related uh, ones. MSCA staff exchange are the most, num uh, most numbered, no most numerous ones with two projects running for in resubmission for in preparation, but we have also other types of uh, EU related project like a postdoc fellowship, ERC, research and innovation as well. I'm also promoting a lot of okay, Kayama University uh, around the world. <clears throat> and I, to, do my, to develop my uh, international project, I built a database of 150 Kadai professors, a fact sheet uh, that I, I built this by uh, meeting them, having interviews and so on. So today I would like to make a focus on the RISE, now a staff exchange project, BRQ. The kickoff was uh, made in uh, January, 2019, two years ago. And uh, because of COVID uh, sanitary situation, we already got ex an extension to the end of 2023. What is this BRQ project? It is about investigation, investigating the Tobio Skakofun, Okayama, by using modern and on-site archaeology technologies. So where is Okayama? Okayama in the southwest of, uh, of Japan. And what is a kofun? A kofun is uh, an ancient grave, uh, meta megalithic tomb or tumulus in Northeast Asia. Kofun were mainly constructed in Japanese archipelago between the middle of the 3rd century to the early 7th century uh, uh, ante domini. Anno Domini. So BRK objectives, objective one from the archeological site to the museum through archeology span and science generated by the project. Objective two is to practice excavation of the Tobios Kofun and challenging studies of uh, other uh, Kofun burial mounds and related archeological material in ancient Kibi and Isomor area. And uh, objective three is to grow up a new transdisciplinary vision of archeology span combined with archeometry. BRKO activities will be accessible and engaging to the general public through media communication and two final exhibitions in museums. About the partners. So you can see that uh, in the partnership, we have big universities in Europe, one in Japan, uh, an international research institute for archeology span and ethnology uh, located in Torino. And we have three uh, small companies, Technart, Terra Marine, and Visual Dimension. Uh, Technart located in uh, Torino, 
it's a startup of the uh, University of Torino, Terra Marine in Greece, focused on uh, and, uh, systems, uh, a remote system to uh, probe archaeological, not only archaeological, but different, uh, different sites where a lot of uh, preservation material can be found. And visual dimension work in the field of visual uh, systems and devices for the, for instance, visiting uh, uh, museums. We have two associated partners, Shimane Prefectural Government and Shimane Museum of Ancient Izumo. So there is a lot of engagement of uh, commitment of Japanese and we could get achievement and highlights in a big number. So first we had a nice kickoff, 40 members from the partners, the EU delegation in Tokyo, uh, uh, Mr. Raman Auskas. We had a substantial number of missions to Japan, specifically to Okayama University. You can see from the kickoff to April 2020, then we had this uh, uh, COVID pandemic. 80 second months, already 50 months uh, of second month at Okayama University. The third the big achievement is unveiling a new chamber in the Tobiotska Kofu that was not uh, known. Up to July 2021, 50 participation in online and presence events as invited. And uh, the promotion of, uh, uh, for, for the promotion of European SMEs, as I mentioned, Terra Marine, Visual Dimension and Technart can uh, get great benefit of this project because they can promote all their products to Japan. And final exhibitions, as I already mentioned, we are expecting and we are building two final exhibitions, one in the museum in Torino and, in one, and one in, uh, in Shimani Prefecture. About dissemination, we are thinking to have a lot of uh, a relatively number, a relatively numerous co-authored papers. That is also something that Japanese universities are extremely keen and they need to get more co-authored papers in international journal. This will help us then to improve their international ranking. So three so far and another 20 expected over the whole project duration. BRKO is a success story. BRKO uh, participated in a Euraccess event in May 19th last year. BRKO produced swimmer school. We got also a major article of an okay, in an Okayama University magazine last year. BRKO was invited at a booth, at a booth uh, of the OptoX Nano Conference in December 2019, where they could explain and promote their research. And the BRKO is also a model uh, of the, among the MSC staff exchange for Japanese universities. There are many online and present talks in uh, AIMR, for instance, Tohoku University. I gave a talk last week to AIMR, how to build project how to build uh, MSCA staff exchange project. Uh, Your access 2020-2021 and missions of Okadai promotion around the world. They have great impact in the master student community and the master, the master student can get a lot of uh, interest in coming at Okayama University. So finally, and I, and I have to be brief. So this project was accepted for funding in August 2018. We had a kickoff in January 2019, in April 2020, 50 months of second month at Okayama University, and we have an extension to July 2023. So, so the EU MSC staff exchange as a some kind of conclusion, it's a wonderful tool to help universities improving substantially their global profile, in particular Japanese universities, where they can play a central role in a staff exchange project if uh, these universities rely on professional approach of research understanding and research management. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. That's it for me, Judith. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Bernard. First of all, how do you see the most important a merit that you experienced during um, the project that you organized with Japan was the most important merit 
and at the same time, what were the difficulties that you ran into um, in this consortium that you had with Japan or you're having basically? Because I know that some of the projects haven't ended yet. We would like to start. Uh, maybe we can go in the order of uh, the presentations. Okay, right. uh, Nathan? Yeah, I'll say um, it's hard for me to say too much at the moment because as I said we're really in a new project we're only a year in but uh, in terms of merit um, uh, perhaps there is something to be said about really um, building a relationship before you get into a project with a Japanese university that seems to be something that was really important so we actually organized a trip uh, two years before we got this grant into to Kobe University to meet with the researchers and to um, to sit with them and discuss possibilities, what it could look like. At that point, Lynx was really a one pager, a concept, but to really brainstorm a bit with them and think about how it could look. The biggest problems we ran in it, into at that time wasn't the, and actually uh, not an, um, two months or six months, I can't recall exactly after that, they came to visit us at, uh, at the University of Copenhagen where I was at at that time. And so did some of the other partners that wanted to be involved in the drafting of that proposal. And, and we shared a dinner and that was a very important, I think, relationship to form moving into the, to the project um, early on. And also it set the expectations for what was going to be done. You know, there are some other partners, European partners that came in quite late in the project and it took a long time to get them into the, to the scope of what we're doing and really get them familiar with it. The biggest challenge we ran into at that time was um, the way that funding is set up for, for incorporating Japanese universities. At least then it, it required us to really have a, um, to be very, very convincing about why they needed a full partnership in the consortium. And I, I think those mechanisms, I'm probably not the one to speak for that. I'm sure there are people here that know better than me. I think those mechanisms have eased since then. And maybe there were ways that we weren't aware, but because it was such a competitive grant to get, a really competitive, we didn't want to risk involving a research institute that we thought, oh, well, maybe they wouldn't. Uh, but I don't know if that's really a risk anymore. In fact, what it from the feedback we got from the proposal, it was only an advantage to have a Japanese partner. So I think um, we learned that. And in hindsight, as I said during my presentation, it would have been nice to have them as a full partner. It would have given them more ownership in the project and uh, allowed them to engage more, which I think is, is important. Um, I think I'll stop there. I think that's it really that I can say at the moment because we're still in early days of engagement with them, but we'll see what happens. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Michele? Oh yeah, I can say something from a student's point of view that I spent some time in Kobe University. So I think one of the best uh, option for people interested in these things is that uh, ask more questions as possible, especially before uh, your activity uh, with the Japanese university because uh, your time is limited. Uh, you want to be ready and prepared also because in, in some manner you are representing Europe and you want to have a good impression with the Japanese uh, universities. And of course, people are friendly. Uh, so mm, just ask for a question. They are help, happy to help. And that's all for my point of view, actually. Thank you so much. And Bena, very briefly, if we may, because I'm looking at the time and we only have 10 minutes left. And yes, I mean, uh, apologies I just, about that. Yes, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, in order to avoid the budget uh, concern that Nathan mentioned a bit before, uh, I am very, very much in favor of a staff exchange program for the Japanese universities because it's extremely simple for them to apply. And they do not have to engage in complicated, uh, in complicated budget uh, building and searching and hunting and so on. And it's extremely good for them to be involved in staff exchange uh, programs because they can increase significantly, very, dramatically, I would say, their international visibility in a very highly uh, excellent uh, con context and they can get a lot of mobilities coming to, the, to their universities. And as well as uh, they can also have a lot of, uh, not, not a lot of, but a significant number 
of uh, co-authored papers in international journals. So that's wonder. This is why this is what I finish my my presentation with. Wonderful, wonderful is uh, this uh, staff exchange program for the Japanese universities, and they have to do their best to engage a lot in that. But of course, they need to improve their uh, professionalism in the in working by themselves, in proposing and uh, starting and initiating the project. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to invite again uh, Maria Giorgiado and uh, Michele Maldi, if um, you could please answer a few questions uh, that we have from the audience. I received a few chat messages in private, and I would like to encourage those of you who are still in the webinar to please type in the Q&A. That will be the easiest for us to read. Alternatively, you can also send us a chat message. So should there be any questions that we could answer at this point, please type your messages in either of these two. Okay, so let me just uh, pull up the messages that we got so far. Yes, uh, does the minimum of three entities required for a consortium have to come from three different countries? Um, it's a very basic question. And the answer to that is um, a definite yes. So let me just ask the next uh, uh, question, which might be more specific. Yes, if my a uh, company was registered in Horizon 2020, will that registration roll over automatically into Horizon Europe? Um, who would like to answer that question? Yeah, yes, the answer is yes. Will Japan also join other clusters, for example, health? Uh, well, if I might, uh, yes, I mean, the whole, the whole of Horizon Europe is open for international cooperation from any country. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, some topics specify that they are specially suitable for international cooperations, but does not include, exclude all the rest. So health is well, I mean, under health, uh, Japanese partners are welcome. The same as under cluster four, which is the talent industry and, and so on. Okay, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, any other questions that you might have? Okay, well, I believe that we can actually proceed with um, the final uh, remarks. Okay. My name is uh, Tom Kuczynski. Uh, I work in uh, science, innovation, digital, and other uh, EU policy section of the EU delegation uh, to Japan. Distinguished speakers, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your participation in today's uh, webinar. I would like to thank all distinguished speakers from the Director General for Research and Innovation, from Director General for Migration and Home Affairs, and your access for a very informative introduction of Horizon Europe and the selected calls in sustainable energy, climate science, and disaster resilience. Let me extend our thanks uh, to the representatives of Horizon 2020 projects for sharing with us their experience and views on benefits of the participation in collaborative research projects and training and mobility schemes. The delegation of the European Union to Japan remains very much committed to support EU-Japan collaboration in research and innovation and very appreciates the EURACCESS initiative to organize this very timely webinar. Together with the 2021 European Research and Innovation Days, the recent uh, launch webinar of Horizon Europe in Japan organized jointly by the delegation and the European Commission, and the events organized by the National Contact Point for Horizon Europe in Japan, the information about opportunities for collaboration under Horizon Europe has been shared widely with key stakeholders in the research landscape in Japan. Now, to reach tangible results in our collaboration, we need your active support. Closes, in closing this meeting, 
I would like to emphasize the following five points. Japan is a very important partner for the EU. Collaboration in, in science, technology, and innovation is a key element of EU-Japan relations, and Horizon Europe is the main vehicle to make progress in our collaboration in this important uh, area. Horizon Europe is open to the world by default. As we have learned today, some of the currently open and forthcoming calls particularly encourage participation of Japanese researchers in the call texts, and some build up on the recent successful collaboration. Let me emphasize, however, and we repeat it on every possible occasion, that researchers in Japan are welcome to participate in virtually all calls for collaborative research, that is under clusters in Pillar 2 and in research infrastructure calls, as well as research grants, training, and mobility schemes, that is under European Research Council and Maris Kodowska Curie actions in uh, Pillar 1. As it was mentioned by Mrs. Guisman, in collaborative research projects, Japanese members of the successful consortia need to secure the financial resources, which would enable them to perform their tasks under the agreed projects work packages. These financial resources could be internal following the envisaged research activities, or could be made available by Japanese ministries and research by the funding organizations. We strongly encourage researchers in Japan and university research administrators to inform the relevant authorities about the desire of your entity to participate in the particular calls and the necessary budgets. This would no longer be necessary if Japan gets associated to Horizon Europe. Japanese researchers will be funded automatically in the same way as researchers in the EU member states are funded. Let me emphasize that the association is the most advanced modality of collaboration under the framework program. It is now offered to a limited number of countries, including Japan, with which EU shares research and innovation values and that have a strong scientific, technological, and innovation profile. This would allow EU and Japan to work in research and innovation closer than ever, be ever before. We strongly believe that the time is ripe to make this ambitious move. Given the complexity, gravity, and urgency of global societal challenges, as well as the importance of research-related horizontal issues, we simply cannot afford to continue to work separately. Finally, all information on Horizon Europe calls is available at the EU Funding and Tenders portal. There is a dedicated page for each topic. You will find there also various information, such as specific work programs, which were mentioned, for instance, by uh, uh, Mikel, sets of rules, and the submission service. For reference, please visit also the CORDIS database with information on virtually all projects which have been funded over the years under the framework program. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with the NCP for Horizon Europe in Japan, which has a very active and dedicated team. They run a help desk, they organize uh, information seminars and trainings, and translate various documents related to framework program to Japanese language. Euraxis Japan and the delegation would be also delighted to provide additional information if needed. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to strengthening EU-Japan collaboration in the field of research and innovation. Your active participation and support are essential and very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for the very warm words and uh, inviting our attendees to indeed uh, present and submit applications. Uh, we would like to emphasize that we truly treasure the help that we receive from the delegation and also the NCP in Japan, as uh, Tom has mentioned, is more than ready to assist applicants in the process. Uh, let me give the last words to my colleague, 
That's your mic server. Who is Hello. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Tatsuya Maisa from Euraccess Japan. And this wraps up our webinars today. And we hope today's webinar gave you a more detailed and nuanced information on Horizon Europe. And on behalf of Euraccess Japan, I would like to thank all of the speakers and participants for making time in your busy schedule to join uh, today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please contact us at japan at euraccess.net. And also we have a series of events and webinars to provide both specific and general information about research collaboration between Europe and Japan. And you can check the information at our portal uh, or Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Line as well. Don't forget to follow that uh, one of those SNS. We are looking forward to uh, seeing you again at our upcoming events. Once again, uh, for our honorable guests and, speak, uh, and participants, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.